some of the complexities of smart grids, which is uh, like most of you know a really important topic of growing interest, especially when you start pumping uh, uh, renewable energy in uh, with uh, less than constant uh, uh, source and load, and uh, all kinds of interesting stability problems arise. Uh, and so, uh, for and, and uh, Francesco, we're going to talk about synchronization power networks. Uh, tell a little bit about Francesco. He uh, received his lawyer degree in electrical engineering from the University of Padova in 1994, and his PhD degree in control dynamical systems from Caltech in 1999. He's worked at the Coordinated Science Laboratory at the University of Illinois for Banish and Pain. And he's, uh, as you all know, currently a uh, professor in the uh, mechanical engineering department at uh, UCSB. And this talk's going to be shared between uh, uh, Florian and Francesco. I'm going to figure out how to do the, <coughs> the visual labor here. Florian is uh, a graduate student uh, in mechanical engineering working with Francesco. He received his diploma degree in uh, engineering cybernetics from the University of Stuttgart, Germany in 2008. So, Francesco? Thank you so much. It's uh, great to be here today. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to um, describe our work to such a friendly audience here on campus. Uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great chance and uh, we're, we're excited to be um, uh, interacting with the Institute for, for Energy Efficiency. Um, today I'll tell you about um, some activities that uh, myself and my group have been uh, working on over the last um, uh, couple of years. Uh, in, particularly, in particular, I'll, I'll talk about synchronization. That'll be the main topic. But I want to give you a little bit of a broader uh, introduction into the, the set of uh, research issues that, uh, uh, that we've, we've come about. Um, and so let me start by describing how, uh, over the last few years, interest in, in power systems has, has blossomed again. Uh, in, inside the scientific community. Certainly from our point of view in the context of control theory, dynamical systems, um, distributed systems, there has been a tremendous effort that has, uh, that has uh, taken the community uh, and, and has focused our attention uh, towards a, a, a bunch of, of, uh, of uh, classic problems but with, uh, with novel uh, uh, point of views. So th th there's a report by the National Academy of Engineering came out just, just a year ago describing the uh, North American, the, color, the, the United States power systems as being one of the greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century. Um, this power systems is a large scale system, so-called complex systems, complex in terms of both the number of nodes, the interconnection among the nodes, as well as the dynamics that takes place at each individual node. So there's a broad range of, uh, of, uh, of complexity, uh, challenges, and so forth. Uh, rich nonlinear dynamics describes the evolution of these systems. There are continuous times, discrete events, stochastic aspects, uh, market mechanisms, and so forth. So the system was designed uh, many years ago, and it is known to be operating at its limits. So nowadays, we're in a situation where things were designed, it's been, they've been patched, they're operating at limits, and, and the next wave of innovation is going to bring uh, uh, is going to require some serious thinking and redesign. Uh, there have been a broad range of blackouts that have occurred in the United States over the last several years. Uh, most of them generate massive uh, financial losses uh, and they make the front page of all of the newspapers. So there are some real reasons that it would be a good time for us to look at these type of problems. Um, when our current president came to power, he set energy as one of the main priorities for the country. And so um, uh, my bright student Florian and Fabio and others set out to help me and, and, and together understand uh, what are some interesting problems in this area that we can tackle from our control theory and dynamical systems point of view and distributed systems as well. And so um, I'm not going to talk about anything particularly sophisticated and novel right now, but let me just mention that there's some trends that are pushing the, the system towards and past the, cur the limits that its current structure can tolerate. Uh, for example, um, we are envisioning having larger numbers of distributed uh, power sources. By distributed, we mean spatially distributed. So we may think of having large scale solar central power in, uh, uh, in the Mojave Desert and then carry the power to the Los Angeles area. 
but we're also possibly thinking about, about having a large number of small solar panels on everybody's home. So we're thinking about having larger numbers, more varied, and increasing adoption of renewables means a lot of variation in the sources of, of, this, of this energy. And, and let me mention uh, the, the classic model in which power is delivered. You have a massive power station that generates large amounts of power. And this power flows from top down to the, to the leaves of the network where all the users uh, live. Now instead, if I imagine placing um, small sources of power at all of the customers' generator, at all of the customers where supposedly there is the consumers, and then the power instead would be flowing back towards inside the network. And so our current utilities are not um, um, prepared to handle this modern new paradigm of having power coming in from, th from the users. Um, on top of that, increasing amount of variable sources of energy as well as increasing demand. So predictions are for large numbers of electric vehicles to be on the road. Once that occurs and people come home from work at 5 p.m., everybody is going to plug in their hybrid electric vehicle into the power network at 5 or 5 p.m. And on top of that, they'll turn on the air conditioning. So there, there will be some, some uh, ex peaks in power demand at predictable times. And you need to arrange the network to deal with that. Um, and so people, well, utilities and, and technologies people in these areas are, are uh, instrumenting the network. They're, they're turning what was just a physical network in which power was being transmitted onto something that we call a cyber physical network. On top of the just a physical layer of power being disseminated, there will be, of course, um, fast communication interconnections between all of the nodes of these networks, certainly among all of the power generators, among all of the power stations, the transformers. In fact, even in your home sooner or later, there, will, there might very well be a smart meter. And so we are adding this level of communication, sensing, and soon enough control on top of this power system. So we are, we're going to be looking at a fairly complex cyber physical system where you combine both the, the physical aspect with the cyber physical aspects of of, of control communication and computation. So that's the picture. And the picture naturally leads. It's really not a, you're not really forcing the, the problem here. It's just naturally there's a, there's a lot of challenges having to do with the increasing complexity, the increasing nonlinearity, and the stochasticity due to the disturbances and due to the power sources. Um, and that's the challenge. And the opportunity from our point of view as scientists is to actually um, add some, some uh, rigorous methodologies and intelligence into these future uh, uh, power systems. And in particular, the point of view that Florian uh, and Fabio and I bring to the table here is that from the point of view of controls and distributed systems. And so our uh, technical approach is to try to tackle some of these issues by, by doing, using control theory, uh, theories of sensors, and theory of optimization. Uh, as well as a, a recent em emphasis in our community has taken place in the context of multi-agent and network systems. So the other, other keywords are distributed systems, decentralized control, and coordination among multiple agents. So we're trying to use some of these tools in order to uh, understand and tame the complexity that one encounter encounters in, this, in these systems. So let me um, speed up and tell you about three of the projects that my group is working on. And then I will let Florian tell you in much more detail uh, um, the technical details of problem number two. All right. So here is the first problem that's uh, kind of an interesting problem. And it has to do precisely, uh, it's interconnected with the cyber physical structure and this communication infrastructure that I was talking about. So here is a very simple schematic representation of a power system with just three generators. So I'm not going to tell you the meaning of every symbol in this, uh, in this plot. But suffice it to say that G1, G2, and G3 are three physical locations where power is being generated. Power flows to various users. And imagine you were to equip your power network with sensors that are located just at generator number one. So you are able to monitor the performance of the system by instrumenting one location. And you try to predict and monitor and ensure the correct behavior of the entire network, right? So what people are concerned with nowadays with the introduction of all of this computing technology are intruders, 
are uh, malicious agents, are misbehaving, uh, misbehaviors in the network that are uh, introduced on purpose by, by various actors that might gain access to your sensors or your computers. And so here on the right is, well, okay, let me just add this, this very simple low dimensional system has, has been widely studied. Um, and um, here's an example of an attack by an intruder which is capable of, if capable of affecting two locations of the network, can in fact introduce disturbances um, at the two generators, G2 and G3. So here they're visible. Here, this is a time scale on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, I am showing the angular frequency of the power generator. So power generators are rotating machines. You want to make sure they keep rotating at the precise 60 hertz so that you can maintain synchrony in the network. Um, and here we see how the dashed line represents the sensor measurement at location one. So you observe the behavior of the network, and it appears to you that everything is acting in a completely normal way. And you, if you were to therefore infer that the network is behaving correctly, you would be severely misled, because instead here is a perfect, phys perfectly feasible physical execution. So here we're simulating the exact equations that describe the behavior of the power network. And there is a possible attack that a, an intruder would be able to exert which leads the frequency of generator two and at generator three to be out of to be, to be outside of their uh, regular uh, regular range. All right. So um, what happens here is that while you are sitting in the monitoring room and you're observing the behavior of the network and all of the measurements that you see look perfectly consistent with the correct behavior, I was able to destabilize the network and create serious problems. So. Um, just to tell you why this is an important problem, uh, just a couple of months ago, there were numerous articles on the popular press about this um, computer virus called Stuxnet. The computer virus called Stuxnet uh, was described, for example, in the New York Times and other sources as being a piece of software that infected a number of uh, control units in, uh, in a power station in, in Iran and performed something that people refer to as a as a replay attack. The Stuxnet virus recorded the behavior of a correct, correctly working system, played and then replayed that behavior to the operators in the control room, all the while sending wrong signals to the centrifuge in the power station and damaging the industrial equipment under control. So that's exactly an example of what I'm describing here from a control theory point of view, whereby there are dynamics inside the system that, that you may not observe because I carefully designed a signal for you to see, while at the same time I was corrupting the behavior of the system behind, behind the scene, right? And so in, in control theory language, this is called something called an, an, a zero dynamics that is unobservable at the output. And so we use tools from, from, from uh, control theory and from distributed systems to try to, to do a couple of things um, one is, um, can I understand, given a power network with a broad range of sensors and computers and actuators, can I understand if an attack or a potential attack is, uh, is detectable and identifiable? So detectable just means I want to be able to say something is wrong. I have detected an intruder. Identifiable means I can uh, uh, predict with accuracy where the intruder has added the corrupting signal. And then at the same time, you know, I can, I can try to solve problems such as where should I put the sensors to avoid these type of behaviors? How should I design the algorithms that will be uh, monitoring the system to avoid the, uh, the attacks of potential intruders? So that's the first area, detection and identification of, of cyber physical attacks. Um, the second area uh, that we've been working on is the one about which Florian will spend his time talking. Um, has to do with uh, transient stability and synchronization. So this problem is different from the previous one and is a problem in which um, you have, again, this number of generators. They're, they're generating power and most of them are, are easily mathematically understood as rotating machines that transform, may that be heat or mechanical motion into electric power. So you have these rotating machines that are interconnected through the power network, right? And you need to guarantee that all of these machines remain 
in close synchrony and rotate at exactly the same frequency and within a carefully specified range of, of phase differences. Um, and so, especially in a situation where both the sources of, of, of power that are, that are making rotate these machines, as well as the loads which are on the other side of the network, when both sources and loads are variable, then you can imagine there is a potential for trouble because the generators have to move synchronously, but they're being subject to all sorts of stochastic disturbances. And so they need to remain synchronous while facing all of these disturbances. Um, and so uh, that's the picture, that's the, that's the, the, the description here. Uh, severe fluctuations in, in generation and load, not to mention potential faults that might occur just because of whatever, whatever may happen to your power lines. So um, this problem is a classic problem. It's called the transient stability or the synchronization problem. Lots of work has been done. Um, and two, two famous scientists in the area in 2006 described the problem, which is the one that we, we got interested in, which is, which is loosely described as follows. I have this power system. It is a large scale system. It has a very large number of state variables, a very large number of parameters. The structure, so which node is connected to which node, might also be uncertain. So there's a broad range of parameter variation and uncertainty. I would like to understand when is this dynamics going to behave in the right way? When is synchronism maintained? And I would like to understand that as a function of those parameters. So current methods that that study transient stability are very numerical in nature. You, you set up a large scale simulation and you understand the behavior by just basically simulating a number of possible conditions. But we would like to have a more theoretical understanding that can be, um, that doesn't require a large number of simulations, but that rather predicts synchronization and stability a priori through a theoretical analysis. Um, and so here, um, I'm, I'm just going to skip this in the interest of brevity and tell you that in our, in our uh, work, not only have we used control theory methods just in the previous uh, scenario, but also we've used this uh, famous theory of coupled oscillators, Kuramoto oscillators in particular. And also, um, there is a, there's a, a bit of beautiful uh, graph theory that comes into play having to do with notions of how is a network connected? And so there's a notion of algebraic connectivity, and there's other notions from graph theory that tell you when is a network of nodes tightly connected. And that's precisely the type of question that helps you understand when do the generators remain in synchronism in the face of these disturbances. Um, so the third and last topic I want to mention briefly for you, just so you know the type of things we're interested in, has to do with modeling. So as a final and last comment, I'll just mention the following. Um, these models are large dimensional. So if I wanted to have a very accurate understanding of what happens, I would need massive amounts of data. And also, I would need to run large dimensional uh, uh, analysis, computational algorithms, and so forth. And so in both the first and the second problem I talked about, whether it is intru intrusion detection or identification, or it is um, transient stability synchronization, possibly also other problems. For example, uh, market-based mechanisms for, for uh, renewable power sources. You have to deal with this inherent complexity of a large-scale system. And so what the third area we're interested in is model reduction. So there are, there are methods to reduce the complexity of the model while preserving its accuracy, or at least uh, attempt to preserve it as much as possible. Here is a, is a, is a, a, a diagram that illustrates this is a, a, a high-level representation of the New England power grid. It can be easily understood as a, as a graph. And then I can perform a reduction in which only the dynamics of the generator remains. Um, and there's an equivalence between the original and the reduced grid, grid that, that we could talk to you about if you're interested in, um, and, and so forth. So it's, uh, it's 425. Let me stop here. Um, this has to do about model reduction. Uh, there is stuff to do with something called cron, cron reduction. Gaussian elimination, and so forth. And um, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'll leave the floor uh, to Florian, who will tell you about problem number two, synchronization transient stability. We have one more question. Thank you, Florian. <laughs> it's OK. This is, uh, I, I have been too many times to Washington 
to report about my proposal. So uh, this is the administrative slide. There is, there is zero scientific content here. I just wanted to advertise that not only Florian, who's here, but also Fabio worked on this topic. Uh, we gave a couple of plenaries, won a couple of best paper awards. And then in terms of collaborations, we have a brand new uh, NSF grant uh, uh, funded by the NSF Cyber Physical Initiative. Um, as well as by the NSF initiative on trustworthy computing. So these two initiatives have funded our work in collaboration with Ian Dobson at the University of Wisconsin and Bruno Sinopoli at Carnegie Mellon. And then also we're collaborating with uh, uh, Dr. Misha Chertkov from the uh, uh, Los Alamos uh, Department of Energy National Laboratory. So that's uh, like a little, just to tell you the, the, broad, the broad area. Uh, there's a broad range of interests. We have uh, this interesting collaboration. It's kind of an exciting time. Uh, we would love to hear your feedback. Thank you all, and, and it's, uh, it's definitely now is your time uh, for you. to present you some of the details of the work on the second topic on synchronization. I'll keep the presentation at a fairly high level, not go too much into the math, but we're sitting right next door, so if you have any questions, just drop by. Um, so let me first talk about modeling of the power network for the synchronization problem. So as Francesca said, it's a very high dimensional, large scale, complex system, and we're interested in a model that reflects the basic physical phenomena, but is also tractable, so simple enough. And the model we resort to is the so-called structure-preserving power network model. And if you take a power grid such as this New England grid that Francesco showed, you can model it basically as a graph. Because if I color the nodes of this network here, it looks like this. It is exactly the same picture, just with some colors and distortions. And there are two types of nodes, namely the generators, the red nodes. That's where power is produced. And the blue nodes, those are the low buses. That's ultimately where power will be consumed. And this entire network topology, as well as the weights on these transmission lines, um, such as how inductive and how resistive they are, is completely captured by the admittance matrix of the net uh, network. So this Y network is a complex valued matrix. And those of you with a background in electrical engineering certainly know this from circuit theory. Um, now, how do we model the nodes of the network? So a simple representation of the generator dynamics is if you simply model each generator, each synchronous machine, just by its rotor angle. That is, if you apply Newton's second law to the rotor angle, you'll get a mechanical system, say of inertia times angular acceleration. You have some viscous damping force here. It's equal to the forces exerted on this rotor angle. And the forces written in units of power is the mechanical power input from the prime mover. That's the wind, if you want to. Um, and the electrical power output injected into the network. So a very simple model for the generator dynamics, but those capture the basic phenomena. How do we model the network itself? So these buses here. Um, so Kirchhoff and Ohm's equation tell you if you're at a node in the network, then the net sum of power is zero. Whatever comes in goes out, right? So if you model the power dissipation at a low bus as a constant real power demand and as a frequency dependent component, then the resulting equation just looks like this, which says what comes in goes out. So what is consumed is a frequency dependent term where theta i is the phase voltage angle um, plus a constant load term. And this has to be equal to the sum of all power flows coming in. So the power flow from uh, some node i to j will be the voltage at i and j, the magnitude of the admittance, and the sign of the difference angle. So these are the two equations we look at. If you put this together, then you get to the so-called structure-preserving power network model, which has been invented in the 80s um, by Bergen and Hill. So how can you think about this model? So the first equation describe the generators, and these are the loads. I did some uh, cosmetic changes, such that it looks nicer. So each of these uh, models has a driving term, PI, which is the power injection. So it's positive for generators, negative for loads. Um, all these equations are coupled. They're sinusoidally coupled through the network, through the power flows. And the coupling gain, PIJ, is just this VI, VJ, YIJ. So physically speaking, the coupling is the power transfer. And that's the model we want to analyze. So that's one that is sufficiently tractable, but captures the basic physics. 
No. The general synchronization problem, as Francesco said, you want to make sure all generators rotate at the same speed. You also want to keep the difference angles over transmission lines small. So what it looks like is you have this model and you want to make sure that the angular distances are bounded between every pair of nodes and they should all rotate at the same speed, so frequency synchronization. And classic analysis method, um, they more or less represent this model here as a system of interconnected system as one big global system. They take a so-called Hamiltonian approach. That means they just write down a very complicated large dimensional energy surface, which depends on kinetic energy of generators, potential energy of power flows. And then these equations can be interpreted as simply run down this potential landscape and run into a valley, a bowl, or out to a settle point. And it's a very sophisticated analysis method. It works very well. Um, it's very tractable using computation. But unfortunately, um, you don't get any insight from this analysis, right? You just represent this one global system, and then you resort to numerics. So as just mentioned, an open problem is really understanding the complexity here. That is, you have the system, you look at this as an interconnection of subsystem and ask yourself, when does it synchronize and when not, depending on the underlying network. So um, let me get, give a short detail on coupled oscillators, synchronization problem. So nowadays, coupled oscillators are everywhere. Um, and it all started with a Dutch scientist uh, called Christian Huygens. He was an engineer who studied uh, pendulum clocks and who was building them. And he observed an interesting phenomena which he called an odd kind of sympathy. That is, when two of these pendulum clocks are mounted next to each other, they influence each other and ultimately will synchronize. So the pendula will be at the same speed. And as I said, nowadays these coupled oscillators, these pendula are everywhere. And the canonical model that people use to describe the synchronization problem um, is the so-called Kuramoto model of coupled oscillators. So how do you have to think about that? Just imagine each oscillator just a point on the unit circle, which is running around. <coughs> so each oscillator has a certain angle, theta i, and a natural frequency. You know, and if they were not coupled, then the dynamics are simply theta i dot equal to omega i. So they're just running around. And now introduce some coupling, uh, diffusive coupling, such as some elastic springs between the oscillators. Assume you have springs everywhere with constants k o n, and you carefully model the system, and the dynamics are simply sinusoidal coupling, sign of all differences. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, no, he did not. Why sign um, it, It's very simple because whatever coupling you think of, it should be two pi periodic, right? Right on the Fourier series, first time will be the sign. Uh, Kermota himself I looked at chemical oscillations, so <laughs> something different. But this Kuramoto model appears pretty much everywhere um, in biology, physics, chemistry, um, chirping crickets, flashing fireflies, whatever, you name it. Every single coupled oscillator model can be modeled with this uh, simple Kuramoto model. The entire book's written about it. Um, a particular case of the Kuramoto model that people are very interested in control is the linearized version of this, which is also called the consensus or agreement protocol, which you can think of um, just a bunch of robots. And the task of these robots is to rendezvous, to meet up at the common point. And a simple strategy to do so is your robot I, and you run to your neighbor J, and you do this for all your neighbors, which is encapsulated by this graph weights AIJ. And obviously, if the graph is connected, you will meet up. In some sense, you synchronize. Now, having presented to you all these three different problems, um, I guess you're interested in how does this all fit together, right? So we have three different areas. In each area, it's more or less about synchronization. If you write down the dynamics of each of these problems, they look surprisingly similar. So it should be very obvious to you that there must be some tight in the connection among these three problems. Um, the connection down here is very well understood, but it's not really known how to combine the tools from Kuramoto oscillators and consensus protocols to analyze this problem in power networks, which would be very interesting, of course, right? And this connection has been hinted at a lot of times by different research communities. And what I will present you now is a possible link in between these models and how you can make use of this link 
to solve this problem in power networks. All right. So let me spend a few minutes just talking about the Kuramoto model um, and tell you when it's synchronized. So that's the model. Now you're familiar with it. Um, what we look at is synchronization that is bounded angular distances, so that's cohesiveness, and they should all rotate to the same speed. So a graphical representation is they're all contained in an arc on the unit circle, and they're all rotated with the same speed. And the classic intuition is, you know, if this coupling here is very small, and all these guys, the omega i, the frequencies are different, then it's more or less an uncoupled system, right, and completely incoherent. So they all run around the circle, each with their own speed. But now as you crank up this gain k, there will be some sort of phase transition or bifurcation occurring from this incoherence to synchrony, right? And it's of interest to see, well, how big does k have to be? Or how small does this non-informative have to be? So how similar should these oscillators be such that you synchronize? And it turns out for this Q toy model, you can really write down all their results. You can prove everything. Um, so one thing you can say, if all these omega i are contained in some interval, omega min, omega max, then the exact k, the coupling you need to have for synchronization, is the worst case difference. So if k is larger than the worst case non-informity, omega max minus omega min, then you will synchronize. You can even say more. Um, you will synchronize to the average. And depending on the gap in this bound, so the ratio k of over k critical, you will also then um, define how phase cohesive you are, that is how much you cluster in the end on this arc in the unit circle. Right? So, so much about this homogeneous toy model, the Kuramoto model. But we're interested in something more complicated, right? We want to have an underlying graph with topology and with non-uniform weights, AIJ, right? So how could we analyze this model with some coupling terms, AIJ? And only assume connectivity of the graph. So can we say anything smart about that? Unfortunately, we cannot say anything exact yet. So we can write down some necessary conditions, which are of the form, your oscillator i, and you want to synchronize with your neighbors. So that's the coupling you have with respect to your neighbors, just all your outgoing links. Right? If this coupling is weaker than how different you are from the average, from the synchronization frequency, then you cannot synchronize. So if the non-uniformity is too large and your coupling is too weak, you don't synchronize. That's necessary, clearly. Um, you can also write down sufficient conditions. And in fact, the literature is full of these conditions. Um, so one that we came up with is um, also of the form coupling dominates non-uniformity. So here the non-uniformity is given by the two norm of all differences. Of and the coupling is given by the algebraic connectivity of the graph. That is, if you want the reverse case diffusivity of the graph, how information flows through it. So this is a necessary condition. It works out perfectly. It's very nice, but it's too strong. It's conservative. Um, so what we currently try to come up with is exact conditions for synchronization. Um, we believe to have found them. And I, hope, I was hoping to show you um, these conditions, but unfortunately, we are drowning the math and couldn't prove it yet. Who knows? But all these conditions now share this common implication, namely coupling dominates uniformity. Then you synchronize. And this is really the mantra of coupled oscillators. And such a condition should also hold for the power network model, right? So now the question is, how can you combine the Kuramoto model and the power network model? Right? And if you just look at the equations, so this is the power network model that I showed before. So I could hook up now a similar Kuramoto model, where it just replaces omega i terms by the power injections and the coupling terms by the power transfers sort of a non-uniform variation of this Kuramoto model that I showed before. And how could she possibly relate these two systems? If you look carefully, then the dynamics don't even match up, because here you consider accelerations, so frequencies, and here you don't. So how can you do this? And we've explored these questions in numerous ways and come up with some answers. Um, so one thing you can do is just take the analysis methods developed for this system and try to extend them in a straightforward way to the other system. So one analysis method that we're very fond of in control is use some kind of energy functions to analyze this system. And then you might extend these functions to that system. And that works out more or less, but it's uh, very conservative. Another thing you can say is, assuming the power network is strongly overdamped, that is, the inertia is very weak, the damping is large, then on the long time scale, this acceleration will be zero, right? So on a long time scale, these two models should be sort of dynamically equivalent. 
And this works out. You can even prove it mathematically. But the problem is you need to make this assumption. It's overdamped. So what I will show you today is um, a meta result based on local topological equivalence that makes no assumption. Uh, it's not conservative. Um, it's very nice. Um, unfortunately, it's only local. So what you can say about the relation between these two systems is the following. <laughs> Namely, locally, neither respective synchronization manifolds you can prove system one synchronized power network if and only if the current motor model synchronizes. And this is an if and only if statement without any assumption or conservativeness. But it's locally, so it holds local. To show you what this means, here you have a simulation of the power network model. You start from some initial condition, and then you'll spiral into some equilibrium. You see all these equilibria at the end will have the same frequencies that are synchronized. The same simulation, the Kuramoto model, same initial condition, same steady state, different trajectories, but you know they both converge to the same equilibrium, they both synchronize, which is what you can prove. And what you can also show that these two pictures are what is called topologically equivalent. That is, you can take the trajectories over here, bend them, and continuously go from this picture to this one. So locally, these two systems are sort of fully equivalent under continuous mappings. Um, and now we may take this result and apply it to the power network model. In particular, you can say all the conditions we showed before for the Kuramoto model will also hold locally for the power network model. For instance, the necessary condition. We can write down the synchronization frequency for this power network model, will, which will not be the average, but the average weighted by the dk. And then the necessary condition is, you know, that's your coupling to the network in terms of power transfers. If this is weaker, then how different your power injection is from the average, you don't synchronize. That is, the coupling has to dominate any imbalance in active power injections. Or the sufficient condition, if the connectivity of the graph is larger than any imbalance in active power injections, you synchronize. And of course, if one day we are to prove it, um, also the exact condition will be an exact condition for the power network model. And just to show you that all this math really works out, I'll give you a sort of non-trivial example. So here you can see the so-called reliability test system, 96. Um, that's a benchmark example from IEEE um, for stability studies. And now we take this model and do the power flow analysis, that is, the generators produce power um, scheduled according to some load forecast. So everything is nice and in steady state. But now the network is severely overloaded, possibly because um, some generators don't produce enough power. There is no wind, or there is more consumption than expected. So this system is overloaded. What will happen? Most likely, you will guess, this is a system more or less consisting of two areas, right? This is one block, and this is the other block. So whatever instability happens will manifest itself by those two areas initially drifting apart. Um, so let's look at the simulation. In this simulation, we have that our condition is just about to be satisfied, right? So we're still stable according to the theory. And that's also what the simulation predicts. Namely, all frequencies synchronize, all angles are cohesive. You can clearly see the two areas. So here's area one, here's area two, but they're all cohesive still. And here's the um, difference angles over these two transmission lines connecting the areas. So they become close to pi over two, very large whereas all the others are small, but it's still stable. Now let's put a little bit more stress onto the grid, a little more loading, such that the condition is just not satisfied. And as you can see, you have the two areas drifting apart, and difference angles, frequencies drift apart, and also the groups themselves are cohesive, but not anymore uh, together with each other. So this shows you the theory really works out on a very non-trivial example, and it's very exact indeed. Um, so much about that um, at the end. Uh, let me wrap up. So we've explored some paths in this picture here. Sure. This one? No. In the example, I have the condition of which I conjecture it is exact, but I fail to prove it, its exactness. No. Um, yes, this one is not stated. So I have a condition which turns out to be very damn accurate, but unfortunately very hard to prove that it's true. And that's the condition I tested. Is there some complicated expression? 
No, it more or less, physically speaking, it says the parameters are such that all difference angles are less than 90 degrees. Then you will be stable. Um, and this condition and expressed in terms of all these parameters. Yes, correct, but for a network in this case, yeah. So we've explored some paths in this picture. Namely, we looked at this problem, how is synchronization related to the underlying network? And the way we approach to solve this problem is we had some first principle modeling to the structure preserving problem network model. And we analyzed this model using tools from synchronization. And most of the math is based on this consensus protocols, which I didn't show but that's the, the underlying theory. And what you can also do, of course, is take this uh, reduced representation that Francesco talked about before and perform the very same analysis and get very similar outcomes. So that's what we've done so far in the synchronization um, issue. What we would like to do in the long run is, of course, write down exact conditions for very realistic models. So higher dimensional uh, dynamics, uh, reactive power flows, and also, so far, we just considered the analysis problem. We did not talk about uh, synthesis yet. But having understood the complexity of the network when it synchronizes, we now should be able to design controllers such that it synchronizes and coordinate um, demand and load and generation. Um, so thank you very much. schematically depicted this, you make me think that uh, somehow symmetry should be important, or could be. Now, I know it's hard to imagine a grid that you're sort of stuck with it, but is there any aspects of the physical response of your system that depends on, 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 on symmetric elements, either with regard to their intensities or, or where they're physically distributed that would somehow be important with how you configure your graph for your story or your real system? And that might be a design parameter you could, could advise on how to construct. Um, so the, the underlying symmetry, physically speaking, is really what comes in and goes out, uh, physical power balance. Um, in terms of the graph theory, um, I agree there should be some underlying um, symmetry, such as if you have a, a graph that consists of loosely connected components, which are all densely clustered, then this balance has to be satisfied within every component, and the flows along the transmission lines connecting these components should be weak. Uh, but it's very hard to, to grasp that mathematically. Uh, the math is always an area graph. That's, mm. I mean, that's not, there's no symmetry there. That's a scalar. But, but you, you really, intentionally, there's a, you draw it for a reason that I'm not sure. You draw 11 fold symmetry there. How did you choose that? Is, is, is that just arbitrary? Or is that, I mean, oh, you it's mean not this guy? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, no. I mean, the mind has an, enhance, has an inherent sort of uh, disposition to look for order. Yeah. So is that just somehow uh, yeah. misleading? Let, let me or could you sort of look for symmetry in these things? The, the topology here is symmetric. So whatever power this guy injects will affect everybody else. What they did not do is put some numbers on these lines, on the weights, how much it affects it. So even though I have here a completely symmetric network from a topological one, those weightings are not necessarily symmetric at all. They can be very, very different, which depends on the transfer path going from here to here. So that's my question. The, I mean, what if you can, is, is there a system response, depending on that weight, it just seems like you get different responses, and some of them might be more sensitive or more desirable or more. Um, I, I apologize. Sure, go for it. with symmetry and well, maybe some of those particular classes of Cayley graphs or maybe some particular structure and then whatever results we have we should be able to specialize them and get some more insights uh, by, by looking at specifically symmetric graphs um, but we haven't gone so much in that direction because the application doesn't, doesn't call for it as much in that, uh, in that plot there that's the complete graph that we obtain when we look at the pairwise influence between any pair of generators so it happens to have a symmetry uh, but as 
Florian is saying that's only at the level of topology because the weights of the, of the edges are actually not symmetric. Um, but our problem should simplify drastically if we have symmetry in the graph. And um, so uh, we're still hoping yeah. to prove the general. I will add also that it would be hard to expect any symmetry. The US power system is so much conditioned both by geography and history. The development in the East Coast, which comes later development in the West Coast, and then finally Texas. So we have very much exhibited a pattern of the West Coast donuts. So for West Coast donuts with a big hole, Nevada Desert, California Nevada Desert, and then connected via Colorado and down. And then you have the high density New York area, East Coast and so on. So very, uh, so yeah, at the beginning you have this yeah. very, very non-homogeneous situation with both production and loading. And then you have this problem of transferring surplus of load from one, say, eastern and central US to the western, vice versa. This is where the big connections are, because you need very high voltage lines to achieve that connection. And uh, then there are recognizable patterns of instability. North, northwest intertie, there is a mold which when it becomes jittery, everybody is afraid of what will happen from the nation. So, yeah, this is the donut. But I have a question for you, Florian. Mm -hmm. A very intriguing thing is this observation, at least locally, yep. that you have this topological equivalence of the second order mm -hmm. models with the inertia with the trajectories of the Kuramoto yep. first order models. That, that might be something most promising. I mean, pursuing that uh, observation, the consequences of it, the possible advantages of it. What I'm pursuing is that I reduce myself the analysis now only to the first part of mm -hmm. because it's a lot simpler. Um, if you want to then say something more, such as reach of attraction, there are various people, especially in power network engineering, who have studied that, the equivalence of first order reach of attraction, second order. And unless the damping is sufficiently large, there is no correspondence. Right. So the conclusion for myself is I focus on the first order system now. But is there something that you can prove about the limits and validity of that equivalence? Can you prove that it is generally true? Of course, I think it is more negative than the reason that. Is there some quantifiable oh. statement you can make? Um, no, there is no quantifiable statement. It's the statement goes like, uh, both systems have the same equilibria. The Jacobian have the same stability properties. Yeah, that's that's what you can say. Before you can say there is there exists a non-trivial neighborhood. Right. Yes, both exponentially stable, and there's a neighborhood of both, but you cannot necessarily relate it to neighborhoods. Um. I have a general question for you. Um, what have you learned that might apply um, with respect to stability and security to uh, for example, India is installing uh, power networks and a grid mm -hmm. in large areas where there currently is no history and no power. Would you do it very differently there in terms of constructing the, the grid? I mean, well, what are some of the things that you've learned that might apply to that, that mm -hmm. challenging question? How to design the topology in this case? Yeah, the topology or yes. questions mm -hmm. of should you have you know, a lot mm -hmm. of local sources with many yep. nodes or large sources? Yes. So what comes out of our analysis is you want to avoid bottlenecks in the graph. That is, if you have uh, power transfers from A to B, it should not go through some bottleneck. Such as an example I showed you, there was clearly two weak connections among two densely connected areas. Yeah. And it would have been better if you keep them disconnected in this case. So the, the current trend is going to loosely connected microgrids, um, which I could fully support by this by this um, simulations and analysis. You, you would prefer a densely connected microgrid rather than a loosely connected large scale transmission system. Okay. Is that also more efficient than large? Um, well, the microgrid would be most likely operating on DC. So you wouldn't have the synchronization problem anyways and you would have, um, you would have more losses for DC transmission. Uh, there, I mean, this problem will definitely vanish if we go to DC. <laughs> the trouble is that the sources yeah. and the roads, they're not where you want them. 
yes. Not all cases. Although with renewables, they have some greater, somewhat greater flexibility. Right. So, if you had if you had local renewable power sources as well as uh, batteries to dampen the fluctuations, such as electric vehicles, then this is certainly realizable. Um, yeah. <laughs> talk that much about that this problem that I presented a synchronization problem is defined on a very short time scale which is between three and ten seconds on this short time scale there are very free, few control actions you can take you can have local control that generate this you can have discontinuous discrete control such as in this example I showed you two areas drifting apart which you could do is just split them up it's called islanding um, then try to distribute load or balance the loads in each area um, other than that, for this particular problem, um, there's very few you can do with this control methods that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. They would rather, they would not even consider dynamic models in this case. They would just consider static models and try to satisfy a reactive and real power balances. Mm. Yes. Sure. Sort of, of course. You know, the higher yeah. And would you just fall into the same kind of category with some sensor networks that actually detect and diagnostically uh, predict such? Um, yes. So, of course, you can recognize this, but you have to react very fast. You have to imagine the communication structure to use. The signals are traveling just as fast as your dynamics. It's both light speed, right? Mm -hmm. So the only thing you can do if something goes wrong in this trans instability level is local actions. You cannot do anything uh, coordinated on a global level. So you really have to have local actions on a node or on a transmission line saying, I shed this load, I kick this customer out, or I switch this line off because I realize the difference angle is going beyond pi over two or so. So these are the actions you can make. I don't think there's any sophisticated control algorithm just because it's too fast. <laughs> 